Hi, good evening to all of you. Welcome to our worship service tonight. In fact, uh, we will have an evening devotion tonight and next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that as we prepare to celebrate Christmas here in the month of December, which is, what, beginning tomorrow right away. And so our Advent theme is A Savior is Born, and we'll use that theme for the next couple of weeks on our Wednesday evenings. We have um, Pastor Dave Olson from St. Matthew here in Appleton to share a message from God's Word in the sermon for tonight. Pastor Bacchus is at Bethany tonight, I believe. Let's begin our worship on page two in the worship folder. I invite you to please rise. And we begin. Stay with us, Lord, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Your light will rise in darkness and your night will become light like the noonday. The Lord will guide your ways. Your sun will never set again and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of sorrow will end. On no day will the gates of the holy city be shut, for there will be no night there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We pray together. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins, and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Please be seated, and we will continue with our first hymn, Hark the Glad Sound, the Savior Comes. We continue with the confession of sin, bottom of page three in our worship folder. As we gather on these evenings and prepare once again to celebrate the birth of Jesus, our Savior, we know that our sin was the reason for his coming to earth. He came to seek and to save what was lost. He came to seek and to save us. Therefore, trusting in the grace and mercy of our Heavenly Father, who gave us his son for us, gave his son for us, let us confess our sin. 
Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desire in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things we should not have done, and we have not done those things we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. The first reading for tonight is from Revelation chapter 12, beginning with the first verse. A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and she cried out in pain and agony as she gave birth. Another sign also appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon that had seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his hands. heads. His tail swept away a third of the stars in the sky and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that he could devour the child as soon as it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will shepherd all the nations with an iron rod. Her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in order that she might be fed there for 1,260 days. There was also a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon fought back along with his angels, but he was not strong enough. There was no longer a place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, the one called the devil and Satan, the one who leads the whole inhabited earth astray. He was thrown down, to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ, because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. They conquered him because of the blood of the Lamb. And because of the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives in the face of death. For this reason, rejoice, you heavens, and those who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has gone down to you. He is full of rage, because he knows that his time is short. The word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson for today is from Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, because you have found favor with God. Listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will never end. The gospel of our Lord. We'll sing our next song, Lift Up Your Heads, You Mighty Gates.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for consideration this evening is found in Genesis chapter 49. Uh, you'll find that on page 70 of your worship folders. We read, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be in the throat of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Judah is a lion's cub. You have gone up from the prey, my son. He stooped down. He crouched like a lion. He's like a lioness. Who will provoke him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until the one to whom it belongs comes. He'll receive the obedience of the peoples. He'll tie his foal to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his clothing in wine, his garments in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, they were called the Jukes. In 1874, there was a guy named Richard Tugdale who was commissioned to go and visit all the different prisons in upstate New York. And he came to one small prison, and he found that there were six inmates that all came from the same family. It seemed like a lot. So he looked into the family a little more. Found out that there were 29 living male relatives. 17 of them had been convicted of crimes, 15 of them of violent crimes. He did a little more digging went through their family tree, found out they could all be traced back to a frontiersman named Max, who lived in the 1700s. And that if you looked at his family tree, from his family came a total of 18 brothel keepers, 76 convicted criminals, and 120 prostitutes. Not to mention all kinds of people that were wards of the state in different ways. He estimated in the 1870s, that that family cost the state of New York $1.3 million. We all know dysfunctional families. And maybe they're not like the Jukes, but we still see it. You can see those crazy kids running around. You see the, the marriages that are falling apart. You can hear the fights over the top of the privacy fence in the backyard. Or maybe that's your life. Maybe you're a product of a dysfunctional family. And if you are, you know the way sin just rips everything apart. That's all it can do. It never binds a family together. And it's hard to watch it from the outside, hard to see the way it affects people, but it's also hard to be on the inside and face that yourself. I don't know your story. I don't know which dysfunctional family you know or if you're a part of one, but I tell you what, I bet they had nothing on Jacob's family. If you go through sometime the beginning of the book of Matthew and look at the first chapter, just go through the list and underline the names you know and then ask yourself what you know about them. In that family tree of Jesus, the family of Jacob, you're going to find a prostitute, you'll find adulterers and murderers, you'll find idolaters who even sacrifice their kids to a false god. When you look at that family... You see dysfunction all around, even the good ones. I mean, here King David is, and what does he do? He, he ends up sleeping with one of his soldiers' wives. He puts him to death to cover it up. He's a terrible father. His family's a mess. Solomon gets money and glory and power and fame, and he completely forgets about the Lord for a while in his life. Then there's Jacob. You know, the family had always been a little dysfunctional with Abraham and Isaac, but Jacob, he brought it to a new level. Do you remember the story? He's the one who ends up trying to deceive his father, trying to cheat his brother Esau out of a birthright that God had already promised to Jacob, but he decided to deceive and try to get it anyways. And the whole thing falls apart so badly, he's got to run for his life. He never sees his mom again. He gets to his uncle Laban's house. He falls in love with his cousin Rachel. He decides he wants to marry her. And then on the wedding night, at the end of the night, his uncle switches Rachel with her sister Leah. Wakes up the next morning. He realizes he hadn't married the woman he thought. Must have been quite a party, huh? So then he marries Rachel after that. And then it sets off this whole saga where the two of them are vying for his affections. And at the end of the day, it ends up netting him one daughter, 12 sons, two extra wives, and nothing but heartache. 
And now in Genesis chapter 49, it's Jacob sitting there surrounded by his sons. And what a crew they were. They were always at each other's throats. But when they got together, when they worked together, you really had to watch out. Because they banded together and they decided they wanted to sell their brother Joseph into slavery. And two of them worked together and they massacred an entire city. You know, there they were in the land that gave you Sodom and Gomorrah and somehow the most dysfunctional family anybody knew was the family of the promise. And now in Genesis 49, God gets, or Jacob gets his sons together and he gives them these blessings, which are prophetic. He's telling the future of what's going to happen to their descendants, the tribes of Israel. And he starts with Reuben. And he mentions how Reuben had slept with one of Jacob's other wives. It would have been like Reuben's stepmom. And then he moves on to Simeon and Levi, and he, he reminds them of how in their anger and to get revenge, they ended up massacring an entire city of people. And then he comes to Judah. Judah, the one whose idea it was to sell Joseph into slavery. Judah, the one who had two sons who were so wicked, God put them to death. That doesn't happen that often in the Bible. Judah, who mistook his daughter-in-law for a prostitute, slept with her and got her pregnant. Judah must have been shaken in his boots. And yet here is what Jacob says about him. We read once again from Genesis 49. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You're a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. He'll tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He'll wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. To Judah of all people, to the family of Jacob of all families, God says a promised Savior comes from him. Why would God want anything to do with them? I mean, you could forgive Jacob for just throwing his hands up and wanting to walk away from the whole crew. And yet God? He knew their sin on a level that Jacob couldn't even imagine. He knew exactly why they did all the things they did. Saw it right down to its core. He knew not only all the things they said, but all the things they, they thought better of saying. Can you imagine what went through their minds? He knew all the twisting meanderings of their sinful mind. Why would God want anything to do with anyone in that room that day? Or maybe a better question is, why would God want anything to do with anybody in this room? Because believe it or not, the Jukes were not the last dysfunctional family in America. As you got together over Thanksgiving, maybe you got to see a little bit of your family crazy coming out. And as you get together at Christmas, maybe you get to see a little more of that. It's amazing what sin does, how it can rip apart a family, how it can leave you with all these things you don't want to talk about, all these people you want to avoid, all these situations that are fraught with danger. Honestly, why would God want anything to do with us? And if you consider all the dirt our family has on us, consider this, they don't know the half of it. Because they don't know what happens behind closed doors. They don't hear the conversation in the car ride home. They don't know what you were thinking in your mind as you were getting together as a family. But God sees it all. He knows why we do everything that we do right down to its core. He knows everything you say, everything you thought better of saying. He knows all the meanderings of our twisted sinful minds. Just how dark a place that can be. Why in the world would God want anything to do with any of us? That often gets lost in all the comparisons we do, huh? And we hear about a family like the Jukes, and we compare ourselves to them and say, at least we're not like that. Or maybe we get together at Thanksgiving, and we see the dysfunctional one who can't even bother to show up on time. And we do all these comparisons with one another, but it's absolutely silly. 
Because in just one Thanksgiving dinner, I don't care who you are, we give God enough reasons to throw his hands up in the air and walk away. In just one Christmas gathering, you and I do enough for God to cast us into darkness forever. You and I comparing ourselves to each other is like the juke sitting in prison comparing who's worse. Or it'd be like the family of Jacob sitting around arguing about whether or not it's better or worse to sleep with your father's wife or your son's wife. We've all fallen short. And that's kind of the beauty of what happens here, huh? In Genesis chapter 49, you've got this group of people that are just struggling. You've got a family that's been ripped apart by all manner of sin. And yet, what does God do? He promises to send the king. And this isn't a fairy tale, huh? Because you wouldn't write a fairy tale like this. If you were going to write a fairy tale, you'd replace Judah with a knight in shining armor. And if you are going to write a fairy tale, you'd replace Tamar, his daughter-in-law, with some maiden up in a tower. You'd emphasize the acts of heroism. You'd forget about the acts of adultery and murder. You'd paint a prettier picture than this. This isn't about a fairy tale. This is about God sending the king he promised. A king who came to do battle in the exact way he promised he would do battle. The king that was born in, in Matthew that we got to hear about in our gospel lesson. As the angel announces to Mary that, that he will be the king that was promised to Jacob way back in Genesis 49. And a king who came to do all the things we needed him to do and none of the stuff we don't. Because his job would not be a job of photo ops and kissing babies and giving good interviews. It said this king came to fight the battle we needed him to fight. The fight that was portrayed in Revelation chapter 12. As he took on our accuser. As this king came to, to take all the things that we regret. All the things your family won't let us forget about. All the stuff you're afraid to tell your family and friends about. And he took all of it to the cross. And he won. He wiped the record clean. He declared us innocent and holy. It's amazing that it would come to that family, but that is the point, isn't it? That's what grace is. It's God's love for those he shouldn't love. It's God's decision to keep his promise even though we give him a million reasons not to. And keep that promise he did. So that what it says in Genesis 49 is what happened. That the dysfunctional flocked to him. We flock to him still. And we get together in worship week after week and we lay before him all the, the weight of all of our guilt and our dysfunction. The whole thing just poured out before him. And there at the cross we see a dead and buried. And we look forward to the day the king comes back and we get the full benefit of that victory he won for us. But in the meantime... He gives us the benefit of that reconciliation right here, right now. Because you can't come forward at worship. You can't confess your sins before the cross. See all of your guilt and all of the things that you regret and all of your sin buried and paid for in the cross and then look over and see your loved one who's done the same thing and not realize that if God has taken that person's sin away, who am I to hold it against him? You see, this king who defeated sin, death, and the devil for you also rules over your hearts and he empowers us to forgive and what an opportunity there is for us to do that this time of year. Because families build up a lot of scar tissue and the more time you spend with someone, the more opportunity you have to offend them and hurt them and the more opportunity there is for sin to rip the whole thing apart. But the king won. He came to the most dysfunctional family you can imagine, and he came to save not just that family, but every single one of us, no matter what your crazy looks like when you get together on Thanksgiving or Christmas. What a wonderful thing it is that a Savior was born to the dysfunctional, the exact king that we needed him to be. Amen. We'll continue our worship service with our offerings. The usher will hand out first, though, the uh, registration books.
We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gifts may be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. We'll continue with the prayer of peace on page 8 in our worship folder. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We rise and join in the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and keep us. Amen. Please be seated, and we'll sing our closing evening hymn, All Praise to Thee, My God, This Night.
Good evening again to all of you, and welcome to our evening worship. We'll continue these next Wednesday with our 5.30 uh, uh, meal, and then uh, 6.30, 5.15, I guess we get started, and then 6.30 worship as well. Uh, thanks, Pastor Dave Olson, for um, addressing my dysfunctional family. Um, perfect, spot on, thank you. Jesus' love and, and grace is amazing that we all need. Um, before I dismiss you, just would like to announce that uh, on Sunday afternoon, I got a call to serve as a pastor at a different congregation. Um, what that means is I get to decide, think about, pray about where my skills can be used, whether here at Eternal Love or at this other congregation. Um, church in Marietta, Ohio, which is southeast Ohio on the Ohio River right across from West Virginia. Um, I don't know too much about it. I haven't talked to hardly anyone there yet. It's been a busy week. But uh, it's that time again. It's been like six months and a day since the last time I was here, and that's kind of the pattern that we are all following here in the pastoral ministry. So please keep my family and I in your prayers, uh, asking the Lord to, to help me uh, make a, a clear decision uh, that's good for God's kingdom for sure. And uh, that is it for the announcements. Lord's blessings on the rest of your week. Okay. Mm -hmm.